My name is Emily. I am 43 years old. I have been married for 21 years, and I have a 20-year-old son. My husband's name is Robert. He is 55 years old. Lately, I have been working at home. It would seem that I have been happy with this family for 20 years, but this is not entirely true. I would like to tell you about the history when I almost lost everything. Since childhood, my one was one year old. I grew up in an orphanage. The head of the children's home, Elisa, who was also almost like my mother, at least since I remember myself, two years older than me, was exactly like my mother. We were like sisters. The twins, Ryan and Olivia, were taken to the orphanage one evening. Their parents died in a car accident, and I found out about this from Elisa, who then tried to comfort the new orphans. Thanks to the twins, I did not feel like an outcast. Since then, my grief began playing with much brighter colors. Ryan and Olivia turned 17, and their relatives took them to their house. For the first time in my life, I felt grief was an overwhelming weapon, and I am only 15 years old. As a teenager, I couldn't take this grief, and I felt like fate showed its cruelty to me for the first time. I got up, and I began to behave like an inappropriate fool. The adults living in the institution behaved even more cruelly. I began to run away from home, to the city, and at night, in a fit of rebellion, I began to stigmatize walls with depraved inscriptions. I was detained once, I was a minor, and when they informed the children's home about my whereabouts, Elisa came for me, and I behaved as if I did not care at all. Elisa was a survivor of a divorce. She lost her child to an illness shortly after birth. Her then-husband accused it of being all her fault, which led to their divorce. She got a job and became the director of the foster home. She was the one to call me Emily. She saw her lost child in me and raised me with a motherly love, but she did not know how to raise me, her non-biological but emotional daughter. One day, Elisa, who had been living a reckless life, skipping school, started crying out of nowhere. Even though we are not connected by blood, you are my child. All children here are precious, but I am only human, and you have my mother's love, she said, tears streaming down her face. For some reason, I was sad yet relieved. I cried aloud and hugged her tightly. As I grew old, I cried because it made me think since somebody required me. From that day, I became an active helper of Elisa and started calling her mom. After a while, I graduated from middle school and started working at the foster home. Elisa hired me since I had become her mother. She turned me into a social worker. I studied hard via correspondence school and earned my certification. I will someday talk to Ryan and Olivia. We ordered food supplies for the foster home, and the delivery guy turned out to be the man I will marry in the future. We talked casually every day, and the moment I learned that we loved the same musician, I fell for him. After this, we continued talking naturally, and our relationship grew. Then one day, he awkwardly asked me to go on a date with him, and as moms receive special instruction to always tell their daughters to accept a relationship, I went on my very first date. As I previously mentioned, I was nervous about going on my very first date, which I finally did at the age of 21. Therefore, I was nervous because I was unable to talk properly. He confessed to me a few times then, on our fifth date, we began dating. Once I went home and told mom, she said, finally, Emily has a boyfriend. It was about damn time. However, I was a bit lonesome and thus smiled and was desirous. Consequently, our relationship flourished. The first memorable thing we did as a couple was attending the concert of my favorite artist after we prepared dinner at a foster home. Moreover, he proposed to me on our way back. I was overjoyed, and when I arrived, I tearfully informed my mom, who immediately agreed. Her comments about starting a family lingered in my mind, and I promised to have a happy family in the subsequent inalienability. 
When we got married, my age was 23, while he was 35. His parents were very accepting of me, and when I informed them that I spent my time in a foster home since my actual parents have died, they were pleased to welcome me because my husband is an only child, and thus his parents wanted to be sure to have a couple with a happy family. I promised myself to treasure my new parents as well since I understood he was my new family. Hence, when we got married, I quit my work and agreed to my husband's suggestion to leave the foster home. I feared that mom would be left alone to run the foster home, and she assured me it was okay. Much better if I was hired in cooking staff. Soon after I got pregnant, the thought that our precious child was growing inside me gave me immense happiness. However, to my dismay, my husband who was once filled with kindness and politeness to me had changed completely. My husband never expressed sympathy for my morning sickness. He even called me dirty. He stopped taking food at home and only had food outings. My in-laws overheard me discussing the latter and brought some home-cooked food when my husband was away. I told them that it was normal for husbands to eat out when their wife is suffering from morning sickness without any malice intentions. When my in-laws heard how I meant it and waited until my husband came then yelled at him, he made some excuses before eventually apologizing to me. My in-laws made me feel like a child when I told them I thought it was a normal routine, I wasn't looking for excuses. My husband's anger scared me. I would walk everywhere while instinctively protecting my belly. The following day, my husband was his sweet self. He genuinely apologized for abandoning me and promised, once your morning sickness is over, we will eat at home then. Until then, let us get out. From that day onwards, I began writing a diary. I would write down my baby's situation in my home every day. Being a man who used to return home late from work, I soon stopped having a proper conversation with my husband. I felt terrible morning sickness during my pregnancy, a lonely feeling and anxiety. But I still believe it's nothing compared to the pain when I and Ryan lived separately from Olivia. That state was the worst event in my life, so no situation can be worse. The morning sickness tried to hurt me, but my husband continued to return home late. And when he appeared for some reason, I smelled sweet perfume. I wondered a little. You smell nice. Did you meet someone? He seemed surprised for a moment, then angrily said, Who I meet is none of your business. I didn't want to argue, so I didn't ask further. Even though I am not savvy about social norms, I suspected he was cheating. I had no one to talk to, so I wrote in my diary as usual. His betrayal was shocking. I was quiet. Our child was born. It was a boy, and he was healthy. My husband was thrilled. We named him Jackson. My husband had long decided on the name, so he didn't consult me. Baby Jackson resembled his father. Even my in-laws said as he looked just like Robert when he was a baby. I decided to love and never complain about the child I gave birth to, even when I couldn't sleep because of night feedings. My son was the light of my life. Now I knew what that meant. Mom said I should come back home after giving birth, but my husband wouldn't allow it. I would struggle with housework. So I did all the shopping and housework. I could do that because that's what my family wanted, so I delivered, and they raised my kid. Firstly, Jackson was attached to me, but he grew and became attached to his father. Whenever I said anything, he would go tell Dad. So I asked, what will Dad do? He warned me, Dad will be angry with you. I could not say anything because my husband did not want me to discipline my son. My husband said, how can a child who didn't live with his biological parents discipline him? So I scolded the boy with a soft voice while blaming him. My son was a cute child when he was away from my husband. He always followed me. But in middle school, he steals money from my wallet without asking. Did you take the money from my wallet? When I asked, my son replied, he said it's okay to take my wallet. 
and I told him to tell you to ask me. I said, I want that out of my wallet, so you have to get permission from me. Jackson said, even when I give it to you, it comes into my hand, so what's the difference? I gave no response. We were having dinner, and they were talking and eating. Dad, Mom was upset because she got angry when I took it out of your wallet. My husband came to me and said, I, I'm a foster baby, and eh? I'm the one who's trying to regain control of my child. I replied, I just said that it's not good to take money from people for permission first. Jackson. He finally said, It's okay to see you, but it's bad to see others. This is my child. My husband says, That's my son. Thereafter, the, and my son told me angrily, Don't worry about it. I will be with my son. Don't worry about this matter. I wondered, Can I put up with this? We're just a foster couple, and we don't have much education. I was visited a foster home with my mom. She was so glad to see me. We had a good chat in the morning while the kids were at school or kindergarten. Let's buy mobile phones today, one for you too, the mother said. I did not know what a mobile phone was. I did not watch TV either. However, when the mother briefly explained before the experience, it's like everyone is always next to you. I wanted it, even I, without any material desires. The idea of connecting was very tempting. It felt very awkward that she would buy me it, but we were offered free models on certain conditions. I'll pay, don't worry, the mother said. However, I felt that I needed to repay her in one or two weeks somehow. I asked my husband if it was okay if I got a part-time job, and he said, For someone like you, you have to go down to work. It feels embarrassing. It was after that when he left that I rewrote the way I make money at the house. When my family members come, I keep the phone off and hidden. When the family goes, I poke it and look for money-making theories at home on the World Wide Web. I found out that there were such points as blogging for dollars and flew headlong. It seems simultaneously perfect. It takes up my free time, and my better half doesn't know. I started reading from different blogs, and last but not least I started my blog. Five years later, there were 20,000 immediately following, and I made money. This had come quite substantially into my life, but when my blog tended to revolve around my family, the commentary on posts, then that his viewpoints were completely wrong grew. I was leaving and apologizing on my blog. This individual is normal. It was my bad writing that only caused it to be misunderstood. I was gradually leaving my blog because I did not want to go somewhere wrong with my husband. It was about then that I almost stopped receiving a personal message on my blog when Ryan almost stopped my heart. Emily, it's not good if you know me. Olivia is also fantastic, and the telephone number received a message. I attempted to call after all. My heart turned out to be accurate with the news. Another life hack. Having been adopted by a cousin, Ryan and Olivia lived in another country. They had not contacted me for five years, as I did not want to touch upon themes that would shed a new light on my existence until I read my blog, and Ryan immediately told Emily the blog owner, that this might be Emily. Ryan read it, came across his name and Olivia, and contacted me to apologize for the feelings about these posts and thank for the love shown in the writing. I really thought that it was not for nothing to open a blog. Ryan and Olivia visited the foster parents' house. When he left his mother there, he gave her a call and said that there was a stream of money in it. I also saved back trucks of money on the phone. I switched the bill to my account since I now have a stream of income. Then I set my phone in the order that I could read my blog. I headed to the house and to my surprise, Jackson was there. I was the last to come as Jackson always remained here after work. Give me two hundred dollars. He demanded per motive via motion. I tried to moan and he angrily raised his voice. 
Annoyed, I abruptly went to the kitchen. My wallet scattered in the middle of the floor rushed to nothing. The troll, he discovered my blog. Emily, you are not wrong, came to my mind then. You should not take parents' money. When my husband came home and saw the state of the house, he was appalled and I told him the truth that Jackson started making a fit as soon as he asked me for some money. And then he shouted, It's not your money. It's mine. If Jack needs money, give it to him. Do you have no right to be a parasite? And I decided to ask a question that was in my heart. Why did you marry me? He answered, Everyone else got married, and he thought he'd be like that. And what could you be? Anyone who wants is attractive. Do you want a drink? Do what you want with Jack. Have a boring night in a clean house, he said, and went to the train. I couldn't sleep at night, imagining this. Neither my husband nor Jackson returned home. With her phone from the nightstand, she turned it on. I had an email unread from Mom, from Ryan, from Olivia. I said to meet me at Child Protective Services for immediate business. I looked at multiple emails with the same word and clenched the phone in my hand. I flew to Child Protective Services, and when I got there, Mom was just on her way out. She dismissed the kids and looked shocked when she saw my tired, tear-streaked face. And then Ryan and Olivia will come out of the shadows. They will look just like that. And they hugged me. Everything in me was warm, and I couldn't stop crying. They cry, and their mother cries. And then he said, I read your blog. Is that true? I just said yes. Then my mother also said, Have you been living in shame? I raised you to be a daughter I could proudly introduce in any company. And what about your parenting? What qualifications did you need to study if this were so? She sounded angry, but she was crying. Ryan spoke. It's not Emily's fault, Oak. If that blog is true, Emily's husband has problems. Why can't she say anything? He shook his fist. Why didn't you read the commentary? Why don't you take into account common sense? Olivia shakes her finger at me as gently as possible. Okay, maybe I was wrong. But for twenty years I really loved my husband and Jackson, it was difficult to admit my mistake. My mother felt this and asked, Emily, do you know how much I and Dad loved you? I know, you always put me in the first place, I answered. I just thought I was putting my husband first, Jackson. I think no, Mom shakes her head. I am happy, I get to enjoy life because of you. It's great, but are you really happy? I don't think so if you get happiness only when your husband and child are with you. I remained silent, of course. Mom and Rianca Olivia loved me. They never pushed me away. They always listened to me gently and with understanding accepted what I said. They were worried about my happiness. And what about my husband and Jackson? Have I ever felt love from them? Books, the more I thought, the more I convinced myself that no. But then I remembered Jackson's smile when he was little, and I had a punched heart. Jackson was so cute, he played with me sometimes and smiled, that Jackson is not there anymore. Yesterday, I told him what had happened, and Mom said, You can't leave your child. You're still married, and he's your only child. I told him what my husband had said when I asked. Mom whispered, holding my hand, your husband told you to leave, didn't he? Then, Emily, come home. He said it. So you can do it, right? I guess it was because I had always thought that my family was the best thing that ever happened to you, and that you should listen to them almost as if it were brainwashing. So I thought my family was better off getting divorced. I realized I wasn't as lonely as when I had to leave Ryan and Olivia, but even though I knew I couldn't do anything even if I had to go and kill it, I couldn't do anything when I saw my husband and Jackson, say with a grin on my face, I don't need you, I don't like you. And I started my life. I got divorced and left with just one signature on the contract 
and what I had packed stuck into my back. It was weird to say goodbye to the Child Protection Agency. On the way here, it didn't hurt my heart, didn't hurt my heart, just went the way others wanted it to go. I looked at my mom and sat at the table uncomfortably. My blog made more money, and I became closer to my mother, but the facility faced financial difficulties. One day, Ryan and Olivia came to visit. They brought a book production contract. Ryan and Olivia have now become publishing company executives. The four who had adopted them were the relatives of Ryan and Olivia's father. Ryan and Olivia's father refused to collect even though the four vowed to adopt Ryan and Olivia as their children when they were financially stable, and they did. Furthermore, they saved a failing publishing company and grew it very large. Therefore, when Ryan and Olivia showed my blog to the CEO of the publishing company, he loved reading it and wanted to publish my blog book. However, I was shy to grant my permission because, first, I had minimal education and felt so shy about writing about it. On the other hand, they assured me that an editor would help me, and I consented. Therefore, we, Ryan, Olivia, the editor, and I, at several meetings, and we published the book, grew up in foster care with limited education, naive musings. Since my followers shared my writing and was highly recognized by the publishing company, the media began to notice it fueling my bestseller ranking. The media began asking for my opinion, too, yet I was still shy. Ryan encouraged me, and then I accepted it. Appearing on TV made my ex-husband and Jackson aware of my book. My ex-husband, who was aware of where the Child Protective Services had put me, called through the phone. How are you? I thought I found your book on the straight. If I knew, you would get that much money by selling a book. I would not have divorced you. It looked like a terrible day and stayed silent. What if we have to live together again? We even feel like getting married, he said. However, I assumed he sent me that text. He then gave the phone to Jackson. Mom, I hate how you are. I am missing you. I want to cook food with you, he said. They all showed that they had changed in their communications. I asked, Jackson, did you read my book? No, Jackson replied. I said, ask your father if he read it. Both of them never had. I answered, read the book. After you read it, you are not able to make calls like this, and hung up. A few days later, cold stares appeared from my friends or co-workers and my classmates. They must have read it because they were in a hurry to read the book. They confessed to me that he read it because he realized it was written by him. I have not heard from my ex-husband or Jackson since then. My ex-husband will never forgive me for making him feel small. Jackson who was dumped by his girlfriend and fell down, talked to me again because my friend talked to him too. I'll show mom my changed figure too. He will drop out of college and become a licensed clinical psychologist. He plans to become a pediatrician for mental health workers at this child protective services. If I can forgive him, I don't believe people can change so easily, but I'm still waiting for that day. Since it is my child, I will think that it doesn't matter with a relationship of blood. I think if you are connected with your heart, you can be a family without any blood.